Good evening, everyone. It's nice to see you again tonight. Uh, we have had some great Bible studies this week, haven't we? And uh, as it's Thursday today, it's a little bit kind of a downer to think that we're winding down and that we only have two more days left of this good, deep Bible study. And uh, I have been blessed in listening to these. I've been encouraged. Um, I've seen Jesus in a fresh and new way, and that is an awesome thing to have happen during the week, isn't it? We, uh, we have been, I don't know if you've noticed, we've been filming these uh, meetings each night. And uh, whenever we have a series here, we have a lot of requests for copies of those. Um, we always upload these after they're all uh, finished and everything. We upload them to our church website, and we also upload them to our church YouTube account. But many people want to have a set of DVDs that they can record, pop in their DVD player at home and watch anytime they want. And so we have um, some order forms that you can fill out tonight. Um, I'm going to see if maybe Godfrey can maybe pass out on this side. And, and we have uh, Eli over here. If you would like an order form for some of these DVDs, please just raise your hand. And they will hand you a, uh, an order form. You can pick out uh, what you would like to have. These are great to share with somebody. If you order them and you know somebody who's interested in studying the Bible... You can get a copy of those and gift that to them, and it's one of the best gifts I think that you can give is a study about the Word of God and, and Jesus and, and His relationship with them. And so these, uh, these will be available um, not too long after our series. We go through uh, quite a bit of work. In fact, Richard goes through quite a bit of work in putting these together and, and getting them packaged and ready to go. And we will let you know when they are ready to pick up. But uh, these order forms are so you can have a copy or an extra copy to give away. You will also be able to order these on our church website at franktownsda.org. That's franktownsda.org. And you can order those there as well. But these are just great to have um, to continue on studying. We will also be having the worksheets, the, the study sheets that, that we've been looking at each night. We'll have those up on our website as well soon so that when you go back and watch these again, you can go back to those worksheets and look and say, all right, what were those, what were those texts that he was talking about? And you'll have that as a resource um, in case maybe you're studying the Bible with somebody else and you want to go through that study as well. So um, as you fill those out, I will be in the back of the church right there at the end of our meeting tonight, and you can just hand that to me, and or Godfrey will be back there. And uh, just make sure we get those, and we'll take care of that and notify you um, as soon as those are ready for pickup. But um, if you've been blessed tonight, I know that you'll be blessed as you share that with somebody or watch it later on. And um, they're great to, to do Bible studies with other people if you invite them to your home and uh, go through these, these videos. I know that you and your neighbors or whoever you watch them with will be blessed again as you go through these studies. Um, we have an awesome topic tonight that uh, talks about the never-ending love of God. And the topic is a love that will not let me go. And I can't wait to hear that. Godfrey, start us off with prayer as we begin. Let's pray. Father in heaven, right now, I am just so thankful to be in this place, to be gathered around this word, and to be able to behold your character. Reminded of that simple prayer in Psalm 27 where David says, One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. God, this is our heart's desire right now. We want to see the beauty of God through the word of God. And so would you please just grant that desire? You've placed that desire in our hearts. And so would you please grant that desire that you've put there? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, hello, everybody. So good to be here with you. Want to make sure everybody has the outline, love that would not let me go. If you happen to slip in without getting one of these, raise your hand right now and we'll make sure that you have it. Man, we're so efficient. Everybody has the outline. Now, you're going to notice in the outline, um, if you haven't been here before, and this is your first night, I've provided a really wide margin, and I'm going to encourage you to take notes. There are going to be points along the way that I'm going to make that I'm going to act actually ask you to write down, to take a note on certain key points. I'm going to ask you at certain points to circle or underline key words, because as you've noticed, those of you who have been here uh, with us night by night, this is less of a preaching series and more of a teaching series. Um, we're actually trying to get in 
to the Bible and find out what it says about our various subjects that we've been looking at. Um, and that requires a lot of thinking. That requires a lot of comparing one Bible verse with another Bible verse and, and, and looking at key stories and key words and key ideas. It's even required us to look at some of the Hebrew and some of the Greek to, to look behind key words. And so this is a Bible study event, and I'm just encouraging you to just bring your whole mind to the process of trying to understand these subjects. Tonight's topic is literally the subject that more than any other has impacted my own life. And so I'm going to pause one more time. I know we've had prayer, but I'm going to pray, especially for myself. I'm going to ask God right now that he would give me an extraordinary level of clarity. And uh, would you pray that you would have an extraordinary level of comprehension tonight? Father in heaven, please. We want to delve into a topic this evening that I'm convinced if we can grasp it will change everything for us. We know that you're good. We've discovered that evening by evening. But God, this subject that we're about to crack open has the potential to persuade us at the deepest possible level that you are a God of selfless, other-centered, self-giving love in ways that we may never be able to fully comprehend. Lord, I pray that you would give me a high level of clarity tonight and that your Holy Spirit would be upon the minds and hearts of every person here so that comprehension and understanding would be brought to every heart. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so I want to begin by asking you a simple question. Have you ever encountered something you were super familiar with as if for the first time? Something you knew, as we say, like the back of your hand or like your phone number. Not that we know our phone numbers anymore because we just push buttons now. But is there anything that you've ever encountered as if you had never seen it before and yet you were familiar with that thing, that place, that subject. Have you ever read a book, for example, and you got through the whole thing, and then a few years later you read that book, and you said something to yourself like, wow, that was in that book the whole time, and I read it, and I never saw that. Let me give a few examples from my own experience. Last night I told you that my wife Sue and I purchased 20 acres one time, and, and uh, we planted a garden and an orchard, we built a fence, we built a house on that piece of property. When we were all done cultivating that property, the house was built and we were living in it, we had been there for a number of years, driving back and forth up and down that mountain road and back and forth to the airport three hours away. We knew the roads, and I was flying nearly every week, so a lot of driving back and forth. We knew the place. We thought we knew the place. Then one day we were in our home, and we heard this really strange, loud noise. Well, as I shared with you last night, this is in the middle of nowhere, so we're not hearing any strange, loud noises. And we run out the back door to see a helicopter landing in our yard. We thought, oh no, the black helicopters have finally come. <laughs> but it wasn't a black helicopter. So we came down out of the house, began to walk toward the helicopter, and made out the face of a friend of ours who, I guess, just bought a helicopter. So he gave one motion with his hand and asked if we wanted a ride, and what do you think we said? Oh, of course we want a ride. Who doesn't want to jump in a helicopter and go for a ride? So we got in the helicopter and went up in the air, and he began to fly over our property, the 20 acres, and then beyond the 20 acres, to the top of the mountain, and then down to the valley. And I said to my wife, as we were flying over this property, I said, Sue, I mean, look at this. So that's where we live. I had never seen our property, our house, our orchard, our garden, our fence line, our road. I had never seen it from that angle before. It was an entirely new perspective on that physical piece of property. 
Let me give another example. I love music. Listen to a lot of Mozart. Years and years and years. I know Mozart. And my wife and I are in Europe. We are tootling around Austria. We find ourselves being handed a brochure for a concert that only 30 people will be admitted to. So you better hurry up and make your way through these cobblestone streets and get to that place if you want this concert. So we said, why not? And we went to this building. We were about the 15th, 16th people in line. People lined up behind us, and we were some of the 30. We walked in. We sat down. We were surrounded by a dome-shaped building that was covered with beautiful art. The building was constructed centuries earlier specifically to debut the little boy Mozart and his first concert in that city. We sat down and somebody whispered to us, this building was designed for its acoustics so that no PA system is necessary. We thought, oh, okay. We didn't know what to expect. After a few minutes, right on the dot, four individuals walked in. One violinist, one cello, one viola, and one bass. They took their seats, no announcements, and just began to play. And the music that filled that room, like a Bose surround sound stereo system, was so beautiful that a few songs into it, I looked at Sue, she looked at me, and tears were forming in both of our eyes because of the sheer beauty of that music that we had never encountered in that way before. We knew those songs. Suddenly, we were encountering those songs in ways we had never seen before. On another occasion, the familiar for the first time, I was stuck in a hotel channel surfing and came to the Discovery Channel. And they, on the Discovery Channel, were doing a documentary on what lives in our eyebrows. And literally, with their micro cameras, they blew up, I guess blow up, is that the word? They, 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 they enlarged our eyebrows like a gazillion times. I'm not sure exactly how many times. And they were showing on the television screen the wildlife that lives in our eyebrows. Literally, there are creatures that look like dinosaurs that are crawling around in our eyebrows. They're as alive as we are. They are mating and having families, planting gardens and building neighborhoods right in our eyebrows. I couldn't believe it. I just watched and watched and watched, and they pointed out that there are literally millions of microscopic creatures that live in our eyebrows. That's where they, they feed on the dermis, on the skin. It's just, a, I couldn't believe it. For days after that, I could never, ever, ever look at my eyebrows the same. I would wake up, I had a new perspective on eyebrows, and I would find myself just wiping them throughout the day. I uh, went to church, the Sabbath following, and there was a friend of mine. His name was Jerry Goldsboro. What a great guy. Loved him. He's deceased now. And he had one of those, what you call a unibrow. He had, he had an eyebrow the size, a single, solitary eyebrow the size of a school bus. <laughs> and I came to him. I said, bro, I need to talk to you. Come here for a minute. We came off to the side. I said, I don't want anyone else to hear this. I don't want your wife to hear this. But I said, brother, you need to let your wife pluck that thing <laughs> to take down the wildlife that lives in your eye. You, if I could show you the video footage, brother, it's out of control in there, and you need some help. So we had a good laugh about it. He told his wife. A few days later, I saw him, and sure enough, he, he, just, he gave her free reign of the unibrow, and now he had two, and they were rather manicured, and I'm sure that less of those creatures were living there. On another occasion, a baby was born into my arms. Beautiful blue eyes. We named her Amber. 
And years went by, and the next thing I know, I'm sitting in a living room on a sofa, and my little baby girl is standing in a kitchen making a meal, and a guy is flirting with her, and he's about to kiss her. And I say to my wife, who's on the sofa with me, I'm going to take him out. <laughs> and my wife says to me, it's her husband, leave him alone. <laughs> so now I find myself seeing my daughter as if for the first time in a whole new light. Now, I share all of these things with you to simply make a point. You've heard the language before, familiarity breeds contempt. It is possible, highly likely, very often the case, that we go into intellectual neutral when we think we're familiar with a subject, a place, a person. We begin to take for granted, we sometimes say, those things that are most precious to us, that are most valuable, we begin to not see what's right in front of us. Now, within Christian theology, within Scripture, within churches, the absolute most common fixture is the cross of Christ. We use it in architecture. Some people wear jewelry that indicates the cross. Our churches are decorated with crosses. We speak of the cross. We sing of the cross. Jesus died for us on the cross. And I personally have experienced in my own walk with God going into intellectual neutral on this subject, so I don't even know what it means. Well, tonight, by the grace of God, we're going to understand what happened at Calvary, perhaps, I hope, in a whole new light, and be absolutely floored and amazed at how great the love of God really is. Now, in order to get there, we need to become familiar with the subject of death. We say that Jesus died for us on the cross. Well, what does it mean when we utter those words? Well, from a biblical perspective, pull your outline onto your lap there and get your pen ready, and I want you to notice something, that in Scripture, this is phase one of our Bible study tonight, in Scripture, there are two kinds of death. Not one kind of death, but two kinds of death. Now, we're not naturally familiar with this idea. We think death is death. But, but for a moment, I want you to just, just back up and look at what Scripture says here. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 2, verse 11, that he who overcomes shall not be hurt of the what? Say it out loud. The second death. So just underline, circle the word second. Second. So grammatically, if there is a second of anything, there is a what? There is a first. So we can legitimately speak of the first death and the second death. This is biblical language. The Bible would have us understand that there are two kinds or two categories of Death. Now, Jesus himself, in a single sentence, described the difference between the first death and the second death. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, notice the words. Do not fear those who kill the what? The body. Circle the word body in your outline. Don't fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill what? The soul. Circle the word soul but rather fear him who is able to, now not the word kill, but the word what? Destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, notice that in this scripture, Jesus is drawing a distinction between two kinds of death. Clearly, the first death that he speaks of only involves the body. It's physical death. It's physical death of physical causes. Now, I've thought this through very carefully, and uh, nobody's been able to give me uh, anything in addition to this. There are five ways to die the first death. Only five that I know of, okay? You can die the first death of homicide, suicide, disease, old age, or tragedy. 
Are you tracking with me? You can die the first death, which is merely the killing of the body by one of those five causes. Now, of course, within those five causes, like disease, there are multiple different kinds of disease. But you die the first death, Let's just, call it, let's just say it this way. The first death is the common death that all human beings die by one physical cause or another. Are you with me? Okay, that's the first death. It's merely the killing of the body. Now hold on to that. Jesus says, but then by contrast, there's something that is distinct from merely dying the first death of physical causes. He says, hey, wait a minute. There's another kind of death another category of death, and it involves more than the body. It involves also the soul, and now the body and the soul together are destroyed. Destroyed. Note the language. The word that is here translated in the New Testament as soul is the Greek word psyche. Now, the Greek word psyche is also an English word because we've just imported it. English is a hijack operation. It's not a pure language. English is a language in which we have taken on board into the English language words from many different languages. Psyche, from which we get words like psychiatry and psychology, refers to the mind, not the brain. The brain is a physical organ. You can take the brain out of the skull, preferably post-mortem, put it on a table, and cut into it. The brain is a physical organ. The mind is not physical. The mind is composed of thoughts, and feelings, and memories, and histories, whether those, those, those histories in the form of memories could be traumatic memories that cause us emotional pain if we call them up to the forefront of our minds. And, and this is all immaterial. Thoughts, feelings, histories, memories. It all resides in the realm of the non-material. Let me illustrate for you in order to make the point. Let's just imagine, for the sake of illustration, that you've had a really bad week. On Monday, you need a kidney transplant. And so... You're fortunate that your ma name came to the top of the list, and there is an organ donor who has passed away, and a person whose job it is, this is actually a job, this is a job title and description, a person is called an organ harvester. You, you wake up in the morning, you say goodbye to your spouse, and you go off harvesting organs. That's what you do for a living. You arrive at the scene of the deceased. You carefully take the kidney out of the body. You rush it across town to the doctor who's waiting for it with you on the operating table. And a lady named Julie's kidney is put in your body. Question, are you still the same person? Yeah, you're still the same person. But I said you were having a bad week because on Tuesday, you need a heart transplant. And a guy named Bob has provided his heart for you after his death. And so the surgeon puts Bob's heart in your body. Are you still the same person? But I said you're having a bad week. Because on Wednesday, you have an accident and you need a complete left hand transplant. By the way, they're doing this now. Where somebody named Frank in prison, has just died, and they carefully surgically remove his hand because prior to death he gave permission for his body to be used in this way. They cut off his hand. Yours is mangled, and while his hand is being rushed over to the hospital, yours is being carefully surgically removed so that all the damage below is gone, and Frank's hand is now surgically attached to your arm. Are you still the same person? You have a fully operable hand. It says, I love Sherry. You have no idea who she is. There are, there are scars on those knuckles from beating people up. You don't know the history of those events. You don't know Sherry. You don't know the history of the scars. But you have a fully operable hand. And your personhood has not changed a bit. But I said you're having a bad day. 
a bad week because on Friday you need a full face transplant. The first one of these that was done was in Paris. A woman fell asleep and her dog mangled her face. Don't even think about it. And that woman was rushed to the hospital. Another woman died in a car accident. Her face was perfectly fine. They simply cut off around the edges the face of the woman whose face was mangled. And I, apparently you can just peel it off. If you, I didn't know that. And throw away the old one. They cut off the other lady's face. <laughs> Sound effects, right? And they just put it on the living woman's face, sewed it all up, healed up, took the sutures out, new face. In fact, it was such a big deal when this, this was the first full face transplant that was done. It was such a big deal that the, that the French public became very upset when the woman with the other lady's face was photographed by the press smoking. And they said, how dare you smoke with another lady's face? She wasn't a smoker. But here's the thing. You have Julie's kidney, Bob's heart, Frank's hand, and Mildred's face. Okay? Question, are you the same person? You're the, precisely the same person. Let's take this illustration a step further to make the point because this is going to be groundbreaking for us tonight. If you get in an accident and your limbs, your arms and legs have to be removed, your personhood has not shrunk. You are still fully the person that you were. That's not to say you don't have trauma from the event. But you, as a person, have not been diminished in the slightest. Are you still tracking with me? So much so that, according to Scripture, when you and I die the first death, our bodies decompose in the soil. Now, that's where you get blueberries and tomatoes and everything else, by the way. <laughs> you didn't need that. Okay, so... Our bodies decompose. In fact, there is no new matter. <laughs> Planet Earth. The same water with which you brushed your teeth this morning, Moses and Daniel brushed their teeth with thousands of years ago. It went through a filtration process, thankfully, but there's no new water in the system, and there's no new matter in the system. You and I are composed of essentially the same stuff tomatoes and blueberries are composed of, but arranged in such a manner as to be distinct, different from the tomatoes and the blueberries. Your body, my body at death, will decompose in the earth. But the Bible teaches that when a human being dies the first death, something happens that we're about to discover. Watch this. Jesus was brought to a house where a little girl was sick because they wanted her to be healed. Luke chapter 8, verses 49 through 55, gives us this insight. But he was still speaking, while he was still speaking, someone came to him, a ruler of the synagogue's house, excuse me, from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying to him, your daughter is dead, do not trouble the teacher. Okay, Jesus was on his way to heal the little girl. Now they've come and said, she's dead, no need for you to come anymore. And now everybody wept, and they mourned for her, the little girl who died. But Jesus said, do not weep, she's what? Not dead. Notice he speaks in a very strong, imperative sense. He says, what you're seeing here is not death. This isn't death. She's not dead. But she's sleeping. And they ridiculed him, knowing that she was dead. But he put them outside, he took her by the hand, and he called saying, little girl, arise, and her, notice the language, spirit returned, and she arose immediately. Note the language. You have here, again, a consistent pattern in scripture. You have two dimensions to this human being. You have the physical dimension, that's the body that's laying there, that is unconscious, that is dead, and Jesus says that's really not death. Because later on, he will explain what Bi the Bible speaks of as the second death as the real deal. 
That's the death from which there's no resurrection. But this one, really, it's not of great consequence. Little girl, arise. She wakes up, and he says, give her something to eat. Okay, so this little girl was dead. Jesus called it sleep. And I want you to notice something in the passage. When this little girl is dead, there's something called her spirit that is not present to her body. Are you seeing that in the text? Yes. Okay. Now, this is crucial. Keep tracking with me here. Speaking of Lazarus, a friend of Jesus, he said to the disciples, Jesus said to the disciples, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. He's sleeping, and I'm going to go wake him up. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get well. However, Jesus spoke of his what? Of his death, but they thought that Jesus was speaking about taking a rest in sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Do you see what's happening in this passage? Jesus, with the little girl and with Lazarus, prefers to call that state of being what? Sleep. That's, that's his preferred language. Why is that his preferred language? Well, he's a Hebrew. Well, he's God in the flesh. He inspired the Hebrew scriptures and repeatedly, some 50 times in the Old Testament, when a person dies, it's called sleep. Now, when a person dies and it's called sleep, watch this. Ecclesiastes, Old Testament now, chapter 9, verse 5, the scripture says, for the living know that they will die, but the dead know how much? Nothing, zilch, nada. There's no consciousness in this dead state, in this sleep state. There's no consciousness. Are you still tracking with me? There are many scriptures to this effect. Another one in the book of Psalms says that the dead do not praise the Lord. Another one says in scripture that the dead no longer have anything to do with anything that is done under the sun. This is scripture. Okay, the Bible teaches that when a human being dies, the first death, there is utter and complete unconsciousness. So it makes sense for it to be called sleep, right? Because sleep is what we're familiar with as an unconscious state. So it makes perfect sense. Now watch this. Do you remember that the little girl who's dead, sleeping, when Jesus resurrected, what returned to her body? Her spirit. Watch this. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7, describing the event of death, says, then the dust will return to the earth as it was, that's just a poetic way of saying your body's going to decompose in the earth, okay? You're going to rot in the grave. That's what the Bible's saying here in a much prettier way. The dust will return to the earth as it was. And the spirit, you remember the little girl's spirit? The spirit, when a person dies, will return where? To God who gave it. Okay, what in the world is this telling us? We know two things for certain now from the scriptures we've read. Number one, when a person dies, whatever happens to their quote-unquote spirit, it does not exist apart from their body in a conscious state. Because the dead know how much? Nothing. The dead don't praise the Lord. They don't curse the Lord. People don't die and remain conscious in a disembodied state, according to scripture. You die, you're asleep, you're unconscious. But there's something about you and me in death that is, let's use this word, preserved. The body, what happens to the body? Decomposed in the earth. But there's something about us that's preserved. What is it that's preserved? Think about it like this. You have a computer. This is a computer, by the way. This phone is a computer. There's more computing power in a handheld iPhone than there was computing power in the entire computer system that put the first human beings on the moon. So you have a lot of computing power right here. Now, my phone is full. There's some 5,000 songs. There's countless photos, like, like 3,000 photos, um, 2,099 
Uh, 999 of them are of my wife, Sue, and then one is, I don't know what that one is. So, so it's full of photos, it's full of words, I dictate into it, I went for a walk today and wrote an article. All that data is there that came out of my brain into this phone, okay? This is a physical shell, but check this out. You have a computer, no doubt, everybody does now. Okay, you have a computer. Is it possible to take the data, the photos, the information, the thoughts, out of the physical shell of the thing in, I mean, you're not going to put it on a floppy drive anymore, but a floppy drive or a disk or an external hard drive, take it right out of that computer, put it on the shelf, yes or no? Then you could destroy that physical shell two years later, buy a new one, and take that same exact data and put it in the new physical shell. Am I correct? And that information, although it is housed on a physical device, is not a physical thing. Your thoughts can't buy, be dissected on a table. Your feelings can't be held in a hand. Your images in your memory are non-physical. Every single thing that's ever happened to you, everything you've ever done, every thought you've ever had, every feeling you've ever felt, every experience you've ever had has created an indelible record of all those experiences and has made you the person you are, and that is your total identity as a human being. The Bible is teaching us that when a person dies, they're asleep and unconscious, and all the data that composes your individual identity, character, thoughts, feelings, history, everything that composes your personhood is preserved in an unconscious state, probably not on a hard drive, but preserved in some form by God for the resurrection. When the resurrection occurs... God, according to Scripture, will give the resurrected people new bodies composed of not the same exact particles of matter. Who cares? A new body composed of matter and the spirit that returned to God, that is the identity, the personhood, the character, is returned to a whole new body, but you're the same person that you were all along. Just like the person who had the bad week and you could literally, like a patchwork, put your body back together from one trauma or accident after another, with one surgery after another, and you would be the same person if both your hands were transplanted from other people's bodies, both your feet, your kidney, your heart, everything except your brain. And your brain is the data storage device that holds your identity. When the resurrection occurs, this thing that Jesus spoke of when he said, do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, which is the Greek word psyche, the mind, the emotions, the character. We could say it like this. There's only one thing that you're going to take with you into eternity future, and that's your character. That's the thing about you that makes you the you that you are, your individual identity. Now, we said all of that to say this. In Scripture, we are told, and this is Jesus himself, that there will be a resurrection, a universal resurrection. Everybody, righteous, wicked, good, bad, everybody will be resurrected. The hour is coming, Jesus says. This is John chapter 5, 28 and 29. The hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of what? Life. And those who have done evil to the resurrection of, what's that word? Condemnation. Condemnation. Everyone's going to be resurrected. Some are going to be resurrected to eternal life, and some are going to be resurrected to experience the second death, which involves condemnation. Watch this now. Here's the second death described for us in Revelation chapter 20. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death 
has no power. So there are going to be some people, check this out, some people who are resurrected who will not experience the second death. Are you tracking with me? They will be resurrected from the first death and never die again. They will be resurrected to eternal life. But watch this, verse 9 now. But the wicked, who in the passage have now been resurrected, the wicked went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. So picture it. And, the fi and fire came down from God out of heaven and what? Devoured them. So this, this is a short version in this one verse of the resurrection of the wicked, the incorrigibly evil, those who are selfish without repentance, and they have so embedded selfishness in their identities that they are beyond the capacity for love. That's who the wicked are, by the way. They're not an arbitrary category that God just says, you're in, you're out. The only people who will be eternally lost are those who are incapable of love. Those who cannot feel and empathize with others are the wicked. Okay? So the wicked are resurrected, and this short verse says they encompass the city and then they're devoured with fire. But then Revelation 20 backs up, as Scripture often does, it loops back to give details that proceed, that lead up to this annihilation, this destruction, and here's the background. And I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away. Who's sitting on the throne? Well, obviously God. And the wicked are arraigned in judgment before him. And what do they see? For the first time, by the way, what do they see? His face. And when they see his face, what is the impulse that arises from within them, according to the scripture? They want to flee away. Why? Why flee away from the face of the one who sits on the throne? Well, in the same passage, we're told that there will be other people who will see his face and be glad to see his face. What is it with the face of God? Well, back in Exodus, Moses said, God, I want to see your face. I want to see your glory. And God told Moses a very, very simple but significant psychological truth. He said, Moses, you can't see the face of God and live. Moses, you can't see the face of God and live. Now, God is saying one of two things here. Track with me. He's either saying, if you see my face, all Italian mob style, I'll have to kill you. Or he's saying, if you see my face, you'll die. Either, if you see my face, I'll kill you, or if you see my face, you'll die. The scripture is either describing something God will arbitrarily do, or the scripture is describing a train of psychological events that will be set in motion by the encounter. Now, think about it this way. Is there anybody you've ever met that you perceived or thought or imagined was better than you in some way? Yeah. I mean, what was high school all about? That was pretty much it. Okay? So, in the psychological framework of imagining or believing someone is better than you, what do you experience in their presence? What do you experience in somebody's presence if you imagine, I mean, I say imagine because none of us are fundamentally better than any of us, but we sometimes imagine that somebody's better than us. What if you're in the presence of somebody that you think is far more highly educated than you and has just an awesome vocabulary? Are you inclined to talk in their presence? Or put it this way, you are at the board teaching a group of people a mathematics class. You're feeling like, man, you know some stuff. And Albert Einstein walks in the room. What's your immediate inclination? Just shut up and sit down. Give the dude the chalk and say nothing more. Because we become hyper-conscious of what it is about us that's out of harmony with what we perceive to be better than us right? Well, none of us are better than the rest of us, but I'm going to tell you something right now. 
that this topic requires us to understand. God actually is better than all of us. On all levels, in every way, but specifically, God is better than us in character. God is morally superior to us. So when God says to Moses, Moses, you can't see my face and live, he's not saying you can't see my face or I'll kill you. He's saying, Moses, if you encounter me in all my holiness and righteousness for who I am, you will experience psychological, emotional meltdown. Your guilt will go off the charts in my presence. So I'm actually in mercy <laughs> protecting you. Believe me, you do not want to see me, not in your fallen, sinful state. Now I'm in the process of saving the human race, and the day is coming when human beings will be able to stand in the immediate presence of God and feel perfectly at home there. Adam and Eve had face-to-face -face communion with God. But God's holiness, God's righteousness, God's utter and complete innocence and selflessness, if we were to encounter it, we would feel levels of guilt that we could not manage or navigate. And we would break down psychologically in his presence. This is throughout scripture. Daniel encounters the Lord and he says that my comeliness, my beauty was turned in me into corruption and I fell like a dead man to the ground. All strength left my body when I encountered God because my moral sin was in contrast to his righteousness. Isaiah chapter 6 tells us the same basic thing. Isaiah says, I saw the Lord hide and lifted up on his, uh, in his temple. And, and when he saw the Lord, he said, woe is me, I am discombobulated. And everything about him began to fall apart on the inside, and he had to shield himself from the glory of God. So when the wicked are resurrected, before fire comes down from God out of heaven and destroys their physical bodies, do you remember what Jesus said? Do not fear those who kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. So the body is going to be destroyed. We just read about it in verse 9. Fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. But before that happens, they're standing before God face to face with the Almighty. And as they stand face to face with God, this is profound. It says that their impulse is to run to flee, and there was found no place for them. I want you just to think about that line for a minute. This is, I think, the most haunting, horrific, excruciating idea in Scripture. The worst thing that can happen to a human being is to feel, feel that there is no place for me. Again, think of high school. It's torture to be in a social circle and not to be in that social circle. The worst thing that a human being can experience is to be surrounded with people and to not fit in to whatever it is that's to have no place. No community, no group, no family, to be utterly and completely out of sync with the group. That's the worst possible scenario for a human being. And here, what we have is not just a doofy high school student out of sync with his peers. We have the wicked described as coming up in the resurrection, seeing the face of God and realizing that there is no place in God's universe for them. They are completely out of harmony, out of sync with the one impulse of other-centered love that governs God's universe. All they can sense in their souls is contrast with what is rather than harmony. All they can feel is, I don't fit. God is love, and his kingdom is love, and everybody is living for others. There's a statement in a book that you may want to read sometime, if you haven't, called Steps to Christ by an author named Ellen White. And in that book, she brilliantly lands on this topic and says that if, she's speaking hypothetically, God were to admit the wicked in to the company of the righteous, if God were to admit the lost into heaven, it would be torture to them, she says. Torture. Because they are out of sync with the system. 
And then it says that not only do they find there's no place for them, check this out, and I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. So there they are, standing before God. There's his face. There's this excruciating feeling of disconnect. This whole system operates completely opposite to what I am. And then it says that the books were opened. Now, when it says the books were opened, don't picture, I mean, for the sake of illustration, yeah, you can picture God or the angels opening big, dusty books made of paper where with ink things have been written. But that's just metaphoric. The books that are described here is just the record, the memory, the reality of each person's actual life. The thing we spoke of a moment ago when we said that when a person dies, the body decomposes, and the spirit, the psyche, the identity, the history is preserved. That thing is now back in conscious operation in a body, and they stand before God, and the books of, I'm going to say it like this, the books in the presence of God's face, the books of consciousness are opened. And one author says it like this, that as the wicked stand right here commenting on this passage, as the wicked stand before God and they see his face, one author says what happens in that moment is every deed of their lives pass before their minds as if with letters of fire, and each one sees the part that he has played in the great controversy between good and evil. Can you imagine right now if by a snap of my fingers everyone in this room was made perfectly conscious of every wrong thing you've ever done? What would that moment be like for you? Or what if I could push a button and on the screen everything that you've ever done wrong in secret was played for the whole group to see? What would that moment be like for you? That just gives you access a little bit to the idea of what these people are experiencing. They're standing before God, and it's not just their bodies that are going to be destroyed with literal fire. What did Jesus say again? Do not fear those who merely kill the body. Whew, the second death involves the soul, the psyche, the mind, the memories, the character. And all of that is being opened like a book to their consciousness and what happens. And another book was opened, which is the book of life, and they don't find their names there. And they realize that they are so out of sync with reality, with this kingdom, that they have no place whatsoever in life. And, an and, and the dead were judged. What does it mean, judged? Well, the word judged means the dead were made perfectly conscious of. We sometimes say, hey, I have a friend, his name is, is Mike, and he has good judgment. I mean good discernment. Judgment is basically seeing things the way they really are. And the wicked are now seeing things the way they really are regarding themselves. Every one of us in this room, every one of us are to some degree, by some means, um, self-medicated. Now, I don't know what it is for you, it could be that you're self-medicated, praise God, by the gospel. And you believe that God's love transcends your guilt. But what about people who don't have any sense of God's love and they have to deal with guilt that is not resolved by love? Well, they're going for other ways of self-medicating. Are you tracking with me? Every one of us is evading the reality of our shame or liquidating our shame by the grace of God. And the wicked have unresolved shame, unresolved guilt. And as they stand before God, it all comes to the surface of consciousness. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Everything is coming into the open now. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and, the de and death and hell, that's the grave, were delivered excuse me, delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one, according to their works, 
And then death and Hades, the grave, death itself, were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second what? Death. Now we're back full circle. So here's where we've come some, from so far. We've said that the Bible teaches that there are two kinds of death. The first death is merely the killing of the body and the entire personhood, identity, and history of the individual in the first death is preserved for the resurrection. Everyone dies the first death and everyone will be what? Resurrected. When everyone's resurrected, they're going to simply resume and pick up right where they left off with the same character, same memories, same history, same person. The righteous will go into everlasting life and never experience the second death. The wicked will stand before God and every deed of their lives will be reckoned in their conscience. And when they experience the full ramifications of their shame, fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them on a physical level. So now what Jesus said was going to happen is complete. The destruction of both body and soul, this is what theologians call annihilationism, as opposed to eternal torment, which we're going to look at in another presentation. Annihilationism is simply, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish. Or as Paul said, the wages of sin is death. So the wicked are annihilated, both body and soul, and the second death is a death from which there is no what? Resurrection. They cease to exist, according to the scripture. So then what about the death of Jesus? What about the death of Jesus? Logically, if it's the second death that you and I need to be saved from, it is the second death that, that Jesus must deal with. Let, let me say that again. Jesus must deal with the thing from which he saves us. If it's the second death that will constitute our eternal annihilation, Jesus must experience and deal with the second death. And this is precisely what Scripture teaches us he did. Step one in the process is what we call the incarnation. Jesus became, or God became, a human being in Christ. Why did he become a human being according to Scripture, according to the logic of the Gospel? Hebrews chapter 2 tells us that we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels. Why? Why did he come down? For the suffering of death. Crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might what? Taste death for who? Everyone, universally. So, question. Jesus became human, why? So that he could taste death for everyone. Okay, hold on to that thought. Verse 14 says it this way. Inasmuch as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, the same what? Flesh and blood, that, so that, in order that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. So again, in this passage, why did Jesus become human? In order that he might suffer and die. Because think about it. If he doesn't become human, he is only 100% divine and transcends the possibility of death. He becomes human in order to submit himself to the limitations of human physical nature in order to suffer and die for us. And the Apostle Paul says it this way. He says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery or something to be held on to, to be equal with God, but made himself of, notice the words, no reputation. Hold on to those words. Taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, what did he do? He died. Even the death of the cross. Again, there's a logical bridge between the incarnation and the cross. Jesus had to become human in order to experience suffering and death. That's the point. Now, I told you to hold on to those words, no reputation. The one who was equal with God became 
of no reputation. It's the Greek word kenosis, which literally means just to empty. Like a glass full of water and you dump out the water, the glass is now what? Empty of its content. That's the point of the word. So the New International Version renders the text, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. That's the word the NIV uses for kenosis. What does it mean for Jesus, the one who was God, to become nothing, to empty himself? Well, Scripture tells us that he as God, becoming human, emptied himself of the three great omnes, omnipotence, omniscience, and omnipresence. What is omnipotence? Well, you hear omne, that's all in Greek. What is omnipotence? What is potence? Power, all-powerful. Regarding power, Jesus himself said in John chapter 5, all of these scriptures are in your outline, by the way, for notes. Jesus said, I can of mine own self do nothing. He, as a human, was utterly dependent on the omnipotence of the Father to perform those miracles through him and to raise the dead. He didn't have personal omnipotence operable in his incarnation, according to Scripture. What about omniscience? Well, Scripture says, what is omniscience, by the way? It means you know everything. For God, there's never an aha moment. He never says, whoa, I never thought of that before, ever. God knows everything. Okay, but Jesus comes into the world, God comes into the world in human flesh, watch this, and the scripture says that the child grew, this is Luke chapter 2, the child grew in stature, that's in physical stature, and he grew in knowledge and wisdom and favor with God and men. To grow in knowledge means to learn things you didn't what? No. As a full adult, Jesus explicitly said, no man knows the day nor the hour of my second coming, not even myself, but the Father only. Clearly, Jesus says, I don't possess omniscience, okay? Why is this important? Well, check this out. When Jesus begins to enter into his suffering and death for you and me, notice what happens, and this is the punchline now. Then he said to them, Jesus said to the disciples as they're walking into the Garden of Gethsemane, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch with me in Gethsemane. What do you think the word soul is in the Greek? Take a wild guess. Psyche. Jesus in Matthew 10 had said that the second death includes the killing of the body and the psyche. And now, when Jesus begins to suffer for us, he clearly tells the disciples, I'm experiencing a death of psyche, a death of soul. Mentally and emotionally, I'm undergoing something excruciating here in my mind. In this part of the narrative, nobody had tortured his body yet. No nails have been driven through his hands. The crown of thorns has not been pressed on his head. The Roman soldiers have not beaten him. Not one act of violence has been perpetrated on him, and yet he says right here, right now, in Gethsemane, with no physical violence, I'm dying. I'm dying at the soul level, at the psychological level of my being, and it's the same word. Now, when Jesus describes to the apostles this death that he's experiencing in his psyche, it says he went a little farther, and he fell on his face, and he prayed, and the disciples can hear in the distance as he's praying. Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. The cup is a metaphor. It's a symbol. It's not literal beverage. Jesus is experiencing what the Bible calls elsewhere the cup of the wine of the wrath of God poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. In other words, do you remember what we saw that the wicked experience as they stand before God in the judgment? What do the wicked experience as they stand before God in the judgment? 
full awareness and consciousness of their sin in contrast to his holiness, his righteousness. In other words, they experienced the weight of their sin, the weight of their shame upon their conscience. Jesus is telling us in this prayer that he is experiencing the full weight of sin upon his conscience. So much so that Luke's gospel tells us that right then in Gethsemane, God the Father sent an angel to strengthen Jesus, the implication being that Jesus would have died in Gethsemane and never reached the cross if God had not especially intervened to save his life with strengthening, comforting words. Remember, you're my son in whom I'm well pleased. Why? Because Jesus was experiencing the weight of our sin upon his heart so that when he came to Calvary, he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I want you to notice something here. Jesus did not say anything about what they were doing to his physical body. Listen very carefully. Jesus didn't die of merely physical causes. Jesus died, he said, of another cause. We said that the first death, you can die from five physical causes, and we named them. But the second death involves the psyche. Jesus, according to Isaiah 53, a messianic prophecy that pointed forward to the cross, it says, all we like sheep have gone astray. All human beings. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord, the Father, has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now imagine what it would be like to be perfectly conscious of and to bear your own guilt and sin, just one solitary human being. Jesus stands before God bearing, as it were, the iniquity, what does it say, of us all, the collective whole of all human guilt and shame and sin. Jesus stands before God, you guys, guilty of every murder, every rape, Every act of child abuse, every holocaust, every war, every lie, every gossiping whisper in a church foyer. Jesus stands before God bearing the iniquity of us all upon his psyche, upon his soul. And then it says in Isaiah 53 verse 12, he poured out his soul unto death and was numbered with the transgressors as though he were one of us. The death that Jesus experienced for you and me was not merely the first death. Jesus took upon himself voluntarily the collective whole of all of our sin and guilt, and he bore it in his conscience as the wicked will bear their sin in their conscience before God in the final annihilation of the wicked. In other words, at Calvary, Jesus experienced universally for the whole human race what the wicked will experience having not embraced that sacrifice on their behalf. What Jesus experienced for all human beings was in fact the second death of guilt and shame and sin. But there was a difference with him. He kept on loving you and me to his last breath. And because his love never gave in to the impulse of self-preservation, selfishness, the love of Jesus at the cross in principle conquered the second death. So that when he died, Scripture says that death could not hold him. The devil had no claim. He never participated in sin, selfishness, and guilt. He voluntarily bore it for us in the pinnacle, zenith act of love. And that love conquered the second death so that nobody need experience it. He was resurrected on the third day for one reason 
because his love had triumphed over sin and guilt and death. And Revelation chapter 1 says that he now holds the keys of hell and of death. Power over them. I fully intend to live eternally forever. How about you? There's no reason for any one of us to die the second death. Jesus bore it and conquered it for us so that when we see him lifted up on the cross, we are witnessing an act of love that draws us to him. Essentially, what we've learned this evening is that the cross proves that God's love, God loves you, God loves me more than his own existence, more than his own life. When Jesus went to the cross, he was willing to die forever to save you and me. He laid down his life to save us. And that love, once we see it, exerts such a power over our hearts and minds that we are drawn back to him in loyalty and trust and love. This evening, we would like to give you an opportunity to respond to what we've discovered. And uh, our pastors are going to put something in your hand, and they're, they're going to do it really fast, aren't they? And as they put this in your hands, I want you just to work through this with me. It's short and to the point. We would like to communicate with you. We would like you to communicate with us. I would love to know if these things are making sense, and I want to give you a tangible opportunity to respond to the things we've been learning night by night by night. So as you have in hand this blue piece of paper that you're handing out down to one another, I'm just watching here. I think everybody has them now. Get your pen ready and respond. We'd love to hear from you. We want to interact. I need to know if this is making sense, and so I'm going to just really rejoice over just looking through these and seeing um, your responses. Number one, not just tonight, but every night as we've been studying the Bible, but specifically on tonight's topic, do you identify with the first line, I can see that the cross of Christ reveals God's incredible selfless love for me. Is that evident? Is that clear in Scripture? If it is, just check that line there. Number two, in response to his love, I accept Jesus as my personal Savior. Maybe you've done that before. I'm inviting you to do it again right now in the light of the things we've learned this evening. If Jesus voluntarily died for you and me in the way that we've discovered from Scripture this evening, we have discovered that his death for us was a level of sacrifice that is just absolutely breathtaking. He bore the collective whole of all of our shame and guilt so that we don't ever have to bear it. In response to his love, do you want to accept for the first time or anew Jesus as your personal Savior? If these things are starting to make sense to you, but you need to dive in deeper, um, we'd love to study the Bible with you. Would you like to study the Bible? If you would like to study the Bible, the third line there just Put an X or a check mark there. I would like to study the Bible more. And finally, if these things are making sense to you and you need to take that step of total unreserved commitment to Christ, if you would like to talk with a pastor about baptism, there are at least three of us here. Myself, I'm here for a few days more, and I'd love to visit with you. And, and then there are the two other pastors are here. We'd love to just chat with you. If you, this is not you, by checking that, you're not saying, I will be baptized necessarily. You're just saying, I want to explore it. What does that mean? Uh, maybe, maybe not. If you'd like to have a conversation about baptism, check that line and then just give us your contact information so that we can be in touch with you, especially phone number and email. We would love to be able to interact with you um, in Bible study, or in preparation for baptism. Man, thank you so much for your time this evening. I, for one, am just overwhelmed. Over and over again, I'm overwhelmed with the fact that the God of the universe condescended to become a member of the human race and gave his life voluntarily so that we could have life. With all the enthusiasm of my heart, 
I say yes to Jesus this evening. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, thank you for your love and grace. God, we invite you into our hearts all over again. Please be our Savior, Lord. Relieve us of all the guilt and shame of our past failures and give us a sense of innocence before you. We thank you for the sacrifice that was made on our behalf at the cross of Calvary. It is amazing to realize that in Christ you demonstrated to us that you love us more than yourself. What a God. Thank you in Jesus' name, amen. I want to invite you to fold that piece of paper and uh, just hand it to the center aisle and um, we're going to just gather those up. Thank you for your time this evening and we'll see you tomorrow night. God bless.